In 2009, a plane made a dramatic water landing in a New York River. We were in the air for 90 seconds and we heard a loud boom. That's Beth McHugh. She survived along with everyone else on board in an incident that would become known as the Miracle on the Hudson. Beth's story starts with a boom. Today, we're going to take a look at what caused that boom and how STEM professionals are constantly using science to prevent accidents when we travel. Today, we're looking at the science of safety. This, this is STEM in 30. 30. Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty, and today we are coming to you live from the America by Air exhibit at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Today we are going to be looking at the science of safety, and some of that science that keeps you safe might surprise you. Joining us today are the great students from McKinley Middle School. Welcome, guys. They are raring to go. We want to remind you that you, if you're watching online, you too can submit questions. Just put them in the comment section on the Facebook Live page. We're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can on the show today. Beth McHugh was a passenger on U.S. Airways Flight 1549. Flight 1549 landed in the Hudson River in the middle of New York City on January 15th, 2009. And because all 155 passengers and crew survived, it became known as the Miracle on the Hudson. The boom that Beth heard was actually a bird strike. We went with Maggie Benson, the host of Smithsonian Science How, and her colleagues at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Before anyone stepped on that flight that day, the folks over at the Feather Identification Lab had spent years studying bird strikes. Let's take a look at the culprit, the birds. The National Museum of Natural History isn't just a place to learn about elephants and dinosaurs and really big diamonds. It's also home to the Smithsonian Institution's Feather Identification Lab. Its job is to analyze the remains of birds that strike planes so that the airline industry can work to reduce the chance of a potentially fatal crash. Carla Dove, yes, Dove really is her name, works at the lab. Are birds dangerous to planes? Well, they can be, um, depending on how large the bird is or if it's a flocking species. Birds can be very dangerous to airplanes and that's why our lab is here in this museum because we want to help prevent that. Carla, what exactly is this? <laughs> it's a package of stuff. This is a package. This is a typical bird strike sample with a report and this is what we call snarge or bird ick. <laughs> And it consists of some feathers, you can see, and a little bit of blood or tissue smeared on this cheesecloth. And this is what we are going to use to identify the species of bird that hit this aircraft. Hey, there's not a lot in here. How do you do that? So we have some special tools here. In addition to um, all of these specimens here that we have for our library, to compare the feathers, we also have DNA analysis and we have microscopic characters in these feathers that will tell us what group of birds the sample came from. Carla, you all worked on the bird strike on flight 1549. Yeah. What did you find out about those birds? Well, that was a, an extremely, you know, exceptional case because in that case we received about 69 different samples. And so as they were investigating and tearing down the engines and trying to figure out exactly what happened, they went back through the engine and they would send us every little bit of feather and snarge that they found. And what we determined in the end is that it was uh, Canada goose, and that is one of the more hazardous species to aircraft. Once you find out all this stuff, what have you know people who build airplanes, what has this research caused them to do? So they design engines to withstand certain weights of birds at certain speeds, and all engines have to pass the bird test. And the bird test involves figuring out what is the maximum weight of a bird that, is, that we can afford to design this engine around. You can't, you know, make every engine 
to take a pelican. That's just too expensive. So by knowing the species and the weights of the species, we can look at that data and the engineers will figure out what is that maximum weight that they're going to design the engine for. Does the work you do here at the Feather Identification Lab help protect birds too? Yeah, actually it does. So we like to think if we are keeping birds away from the airplanes, then they're not getting hit by the airplanes. And a, when a bird and an airplane collides, the bird is not the winner. So by keeping the birds away from the airplanes, we are also helping to save birds. All of the major airports have wildlife biologists who are there to scare the birds away or to let pilots know when it's safe to fly and when it's not. And um, that's something that everybody should remember is this is not a scary thing. We have people out there who are trying their hardest to help prevent this from happening for the bird's sake and for human safety. Who knew that studying birds could save lives? Well, I guess you guys do. Well, yeah, we did, of course. <laughs> okay. I am joined by uh, materials engineer Eric Mueller, who works for the National Transportation Safety Board, or the NTSB. Eric, what does the NTSB do? So the NTSB is an independent government agency whose job it is to investigate accidents from all modes of transportation. Obviously, we just talked about airplanes and aircraft, but we also investigate uh, accidents related to train derailments as well as pipeline, uh, marine accidents, and certain um, commercial uh, highway uh, investigations. The one thing we don't do is your personal vehicle. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your job, your materials engineer, but what does that mean? Right, Beth. So as you said, I'm a materials engineer, which is I'm involved in the engineering of materials, anything from metals to plastics, glasses, all kinds of things. Specifically, what I do at the NTSB is I look at broken parts, um, where they broke or fractured, and I look at the fracture surfaces. Because when something breaks, um, it leaves telltale features or signs, um, kind of giving an idea of what happened when those parts broke. Now, Eric uh, investigates or looks at bits and pieces, but there are several other scientists and researchers working at the NTSB. Let's see what their jobs are. I'm a materials research engineer at the National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, D.C. I am a vehicle performance engineer. I'm an electronics engineer. I'm a materials engineer for the National Transportation Safety Board. My role in the investigation is um, mainly to collect facts. So my job is to collect any sort of data related to the investigation. This um, involves all sorts of electronic devices and so starting from the very beginning I, I specialize in both aviation and highway accidents though we also cover rail and marine accidents and for example for a highway crash I'll be there on scene collecting those devices. My job as vehicle performance engineer is to take a look at the different data sources that we have available and to see if the, in my case, the airplane or aircraft, the helicopter, will, flew through the points of data that we have in a way that makes sense. Um, was the aircraft behaving as one would expect according to physics and aerodynamic principles, or was it doing something more unusual and unexpected? We will do all of our work here in the laboratory using um, our microscopes and our various analytical equipment to determine how the material performed in the accident. So we will try to determine whether a material failure caused the accident or affected the survivability in any way. With science, that is not the knowledge, but the pursuit of the knowledge. In searching for an accident, we are not looking to place blame or culpability. Rather, we want to figure out what happened so that we can prevent that same sequence of events from happening again. Eric, I think you've got a little experiment that you want to run here. Right, so I was trying to get a little quick idea of like what I have to do as a materials engineer and, and, and why we know the things that we know. So I work on a lot of broken airplane parts, but I can't bring them here for a federal investigation. So instead I brought some food. Okay. Um, so we have over here a uh, gummy worm and we over here, over here a bar of chocolate. These are different materials and so they'll have different material properties. So what I want you to do is I want you to take the gummy worm and I want you to pull it till apart till it breaks. And I want you to take that chocolate bar and I want you to bend it until it breaks. Okay, 
So you'll notice like this one deformed a lot before it broke, but the chocolate bar did not. Anything else you notice about your fracture surface where it broke? What do you notice? Um, I see that it's like um, little pieces of chocolate, like right in the middle, and it looks like like it's not smooth like the um, like it was before. It broke. Right, but is the fracture surface like kind of rough or is it flat generally? It's rough. Okay. Okay. What do you have? What do you notice? Um, on this side, it's larger, and this side is smaller. They're still basically the same. Right, exactly. So the different halves can give telltale evidence as to what happened with this gummy worm. You can go ahead and eat some of your parts right now. But as I don't want to just have sugary sweets here, I also brought some healthy food as well. So you both have a carrot, um, and this is the same material. But um, when I have you break it, I want you to break it in different ways. So I'll have you bend your carrot. And Trina, if you can twist your carrot when you break it. So, what do you notice different about your carrot? Oh, um, is when I twisted it, it it broke right away, and it's like the the, the breaking part is not like even. It's like um, I don't know how to say, it, but it's like uh. Is it twisted? Yeah, it's twisted. Right, and yours? It's like. It's just like you can't find a way to put it back together. Right, well that's another thing too. So yours is generally flat and yours is generally kind of a twisted look to it. It's the same carrot, it's the same material, and you have about the same force, but it's just the direction in which you put that force on there uh, that broke, the, broke it apart. So when I come upon a scene, I'll see a part that will have either a fracture surface that looks like this or possibly like this. And so from the knowledge I already know about that material, I can begin to start to figure out what kind of loads and what kind of way that part broke right before the, or as the accident occurred. Okay, you guys can take your candy and sit down. Go ahead, take your candy and sit down. Eric, do you want to tell us a little bit about one of the more interesting cases that you've worked on? So as we've discussed a lot, um, at the NTSB we do a lot of airplane accidents. But one of my more memorable ones was a train derailment that happened in a cold day in December 30th, 2013 in Castleton, North Dakota. In this situation, we had uh, two trains and one of them derailed and one was carrying a lot of crude oil. And as you can see in the picture here, uh, the crude oil, and that was over 400,000 gallons, caught fire and had uh, what looks like an explosion we called an energetic release. Um, fortunately, nobody was hurt in this accident or this derailment, but it did cause a lot of environmental damage and we did have to evacuate a lot of people from the nearby towns. So our accident investigators went to this scene um, which was a big mess, and they had to decipher through a bunch of the evidence. So lo and behold, what you see there is that they discovered this broken train axle. And a train axle basically has two wheels pushed on it, and the train cars sit on top of this axle. So this was the part, and this is a several thousand pound part, that came back to my lab, and my job was to begin looking at where that broke. And so you can see here, this is a section of that fracture surface from that train wheel, or sorry, train axle. And one thing you might notice right away is there's a big hole in the middle of it. That's not normal. A train axle is supposed to be a solid piece of steel. Well, one thing I noticed was there's a crack uh, that began to grow from the inside where that hole was in the train axle all the way to the outside. And so this was very unusual. This had not happened before um, in looking at train axles in the past. So one of the things I was able to do was take a laser scanner, scan both those surfaces, so I had all the points of all the different fracture pieces, and then put them back together to reconstruct what this hole or void in the center of the axle looked like, which is what you see in the top part. Wow. From there, knowing that, we had our really smart finite element people go through and figure out where the maximum stresses might be on that part. And lo and behold, that was exactly where the crack on the inside had begun uh, to start and grow outward from. Wow. Are you ready to take some questions? I'm ready to take some All questions. All right, let's start with an online question. What are aircraft manufacturers doing to decrease incidents such as the Miracle on the Hudson? So with the Miracle on the Hudson, um, the NTSB obviously investigated that and we had lots of recommendations not just to the engine manufacturers but all across the board. One of the biggest things was better communication. But the aircraft engine manufacturers also now have better standards for uh, testing as well as preventing and mitigating issues like having birds come in sure. there. And really the best way is prevention. So one of the best things that we've had start now is having basically having the birds disperse before any air, aircraft can take off and better communications with the aircraft before they begin to take off. 
We have a question in the audience. Hi, my name is Aria. When is the NTSB called in to investigate on an accident? When do they call you guys in? Uh, they call us in all the time. <laughs> so it kind of depends on the mode. And my mode, I mean whether it's a plane or whether it's a train or something else. So we're required to investigate all airplane accidents that happen in the country. Uh, we're called to investigate most train derailments. And we also have special memorandum uh, with the United States Coast Guard uh, for marine vessel accidents. Those have to be over a certain tonnage and, and certain um, you know, monetary value. We also investigate uh, pipelines, which many people don't know about, okay. as well as a lot of um, you know, highway accidents involving motor coaches, buses, and things like that. The one thing we do not investigate, um, unless there's some special circumstance, is your own personal vehicle. Okay, let's take another audience question. Hi, my name is Lowell. Um, Lowell, how did you get interested in becoming an engineer? How did how did you be in, become interested in becoming an engineer? Basically, by failing at everything else I had done before that. <laughs> no, um, becoming an engineer was something that I had some good friends that were doing, and I started looking into it. And while not every engineering field was interesting to me, the materials engineering was. And so once I found an interest in that. I started to begin learning about the this, this subject and studying really hard to get better at it. Well, Beth's story started with a boom. Let's see what happened next. The captain said, this is your captain brace for impact. And everybody needed to brace in the brace position with your head down, arms over your head, if possible. And the flight attendants kept yelling, brace, brace, heads down, stay down, brace, brace. And we hit the water at 3.31. And we hit the water going 150 miles an hour still. So it was a huge impact. And when you look at the plane, you can see the large 15 to 20 foot hole in the bottom of the fuselage that is, was torn in the plane at the time it hit, which allowed water to come in then to the cabin. And we could see it coming up immediately. It was rising very fast. So, those of us who were in the back of the plane were already really wet by the time we got out of the plane. All right, well, I'm joined by Demetrius and Skye, and you guys heard Beth talk about the force of that landing. We have a little demonstration here to talk about force. Now, I've got a question for you guys. Have you ever flown? Yes. Have you flown? Yeah. Okay, so when you're flying, what happens to your body when that plane starts to take off? You go backwards. Yeah, you get pushed back into your seat a little bit. And Now, have you guys ever ridden in a car? Yeah. Okay, so what happens when you're in a car and, and the, um, the driver steps on the brakes real quick? You move forward. Yeah, you go forward real fast. And those are real world examples of Newton's laws. An object in motion stays in motion. An object in rest stays in rest unless it's acted upon by a force. In the airplane, that force is the airplane starting to take off and it pulls you back into the seat because your body wants to stay at rest. On the car, your body's already moving and it wants to keep moving. And so when that driver hits the brakes, you go forward. And that's one of the reasons why seat belts are so important. Now we've got a great little demo here that you can do in your classroom. Um, and so uh, Demetrius is gonna come over here and he's going to apply a force to this tablecloth. Now, right now, there's no force of being applied to anything. So Demetrius, I want you to go not real fast, but not real slow, and we're gonna see what happens. Go for it. Oh, it didn't quite make it. We knocked it over. We made a little bit of a mess there. Not bad, good try. So when he applied that force, the force from the tablecloth got applied because of friction to the glass and the, and the plate and the spoon. Now Sky is gonna come over and she's gonna apply a little bit more force to try to overcome that friction. So come on over here, Sky. Let's see what's gonna happen. So I want a nice, solid yank on that tablecloth. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Woo, look at that, that was awesome. A real world example of Newton's laws. And teachers, we want to see your videos of this. If you do this in your classroom, send us this, the videos. Now, you guys, if you try this at home tonight, you might wanna ask your parents first, okay? Um, so the NTSB, to learn from accidents, has to understand what happened. And inside airplanes, there are recorders. You've probably heard of them, but they look a little bit different than what you might think. What is this? This is what is colloquially called a black box. It is not black, Eric. It isn't? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Why is it orange? Well, 
This is actually a cockpit voice recorder. Okay. And this is something we want to find after an accident. So where do you think parts are that usually, you know, after an accident? They're not technically with the... Right. They may be hard to find. Fine. So having this bright orange color makes it easier to find visually for people looking for this. What's inside here? Um, well, actually, inside here uh, is a lot of insulation and everything to basically keep the parts inside from being destroyed or damaged during the accident. But inside is a small little memory module which basically records everything that the pilots are saying during the course of the flight. That's it? That's it. That's uh, it. So all of this protects this little tiny piece of equipment. That's right, but all the engineering and design that went into this is basically to keep this secure through all kinds of different events as far as like impact with the ground and temperatures at either high, t high temperatures or long times. Now we do want to say that we took this off very easily, but you had unbolted it before. The idea is not to be able to just lift this no, off. No, this instrument is made not to be taken apart very easily. Why is this information important? So when an accident occurs, um, a lot of times they'll end up looking the same at the end. But the circumstances that led to that accident may not be known. And so this is some of the data that we can use to determine what may have been going on uh, with the flight before the accident occurred. And all modern aircraft have one of these on? All modern commercial aircraft that you fly will have one of these, as well as what's called a flight data recorder, which records what the plane is doing during the flight. Okay, you ready for some more questions? No, but I'll go my, do my best. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's take an online question. Did the NTSB have any recommendations after the miracle on the Hudson crash? Yes. The NTSB had a whole slew of recommendations afterward. Um, anything from recommending better prevention of birds uh, flying around the airports as well as better defense and, and better testing for the engine manufacturers. There's also a lot of recommendations for better procedures as far as training because one thing that hadn't happened as much before was that losing both engines due to a bird strike okay. or any other reason. So that's one of the things now the pilots as well as the cabin crew train for um, frequently before flight. All right, let's take an audience question. Um, hello, my name is Seth, and my question is, is it really important to wear a seatbelt? Is it really important to wear a seatbelt? Yes, Beth, and yes, Seth, <laughs> it is important to wear your seatbelt. Because basically what the seatbelt do, does is it keeps you attached to the car, or if you're on an airplane, it's also important to wear your seatbelt as well. Because when the car stops, you won't, and that's when bad things can happen, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, let's take another audience question. Uh, my name's Isaac. Do Personal device like cell phone or tablet play a role in researching an accident? So you have the black box recorder, but do personal devices like the cell phone or tablet, do, do they help with the investigation? Absolutely. While this can not necessarily always be helpful in some investigations, Use of cell, downloading cell phone data can be extremely helpful. It can give us information like was some person uh, talking or texting or communicating ahead of time, um, as well as other data like possibly like what towers they might have been communicating with in the cell, cell, cellular network. So yes, we can find that information out, and we will find out eventually. We have another. We have time for another audience question. My name is Makai, and my question is: How dangerous is texting and driving? How dangerous is texting and driving? Texting and driving can definitely be very dangerous. It's real easy if you've ever just walked around with your cell phone and tripped on something. Um, that happens while you're walking maybe up to five miles an hour tops. If one is driving at over 60 miles an hour, uh, a lot of things can happen in a short amount of time when you're distracted. All right, uh, another audience question. Hi, my name is Milky. What can I do to keep myself safe when traveling? What can we do to keep ourselves safe when we're traveling? So one of the best things one can do uh, when traveling, whether it's in a car or whether it's an airplane, is just being aware of your surroundings, being aware of the situation. Um, another thing is staying in shape is always helpful as well, too. We have a, another online question. Uh, do all planes have black boxes? Now, you said commercial airplanes, but what about private airplanes? Um, that's one of the things we are trying, we're working really hard to do. Most uh, private airplanes do have some sort of recording uh, devices, but not all, especially because many, pe many private pilots fly airplanes that you know, predate some of this, uh, re these requirements. But we're definitely working hard to make sure that all aircraft have them. Okay, so Beth McHugh went through a harrowing experience. Let's see how it ended.
I hesitated because I looked down and there was a life raft hanging off of the door but hanging down into the water. And it looked like about five or six feet that I would have to jump down before I touched the life raft. So it frightened me a little bit, but the flight attendant put her hand on my back and very gently said, you have to jump, close your eyes and jump. And I did. And, and I landed down in the life raft. It had about a foot of ice cold water in it. And there were probably 12 people in the raft already. So I slid down into the lower part of the raft along with them. So the raft was filling up quickly. And at some point, the captain and the first officer came into that same raft. And we looked up, it was probably four or five minutes after we were out there in the raft, and we saw these giant ferry boats steaming towards us from both sides of the river and heading towards us at top speed. So we actually felt at that point that we could be rescued. The fact that everyone on board made it out safely is absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. This month, we looked at the science of safety. Next month, we'll be taking a look at the engineering behind the world record skydive. Check this out. This is the suit that Alan Eustace wore when he set the world record skydive. Imagine being in this suit underneath a giant balloon, flying up into the atmosphere above where birds fly, above where airplanes fly, over 25 miles up into the stratosphere releasing yourself from the suit and plummeting back to earth, breaking the sound barrier with nothing but your body and this suit. If you want to learn more about the world record skydive, check out STEM in 30. We'd like to thank Eric Mueller for being here from the NTSB, and we'd like to thank our sponsor, Boeing. We'd also like to thank McKinley Middle School for joining us today. You guys were great. We want everybody to keep in mind that when you are traveling, there are people out there keeping you safe. Safe travels. Thanks for watching.